Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this master class on total joint replacement for the lumbar spine presented by 3Spine. My name is Robin Young. I'm the founder and, and publisher of Orthopedics This Week, and I'm honored to be the moderator tonight. As we all know, the practice of orthopedic and spine surgery is constantly evolving, innovating, and advancing. And today, we have the privilege of learning about a new and exciting new procedure that is currently in U.S. clinical trials. The topic is total joint replacement for the lumbar spine, and that's an incredibly important and relevant one as it has the potential to revolutionize the way we approach the degenerative spine, uh, spine disorders. We are lucky to have three truly accomplished and knowledgeable speakers with us tonight who will be sharing their expertise and experience with the three spine modus technology. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Scott Hodges, who is a fellowship trained orthopedic spine surgeon and the co-founder and medical director of Three Spine. His work to develop the lumbar total joint replacement for lumbar spine spans nearly two thirds of his 34 year surgical career. It has been incredible to learn about his work and I am quite excited to have him presenting here today. Our second speaker is Dr. Avinash Patwarden, who is director of the Musculoskeletal Biomechanics Lab at the Edward Hines VA Hospital and professor of orthopedic surgery and rehabilitation at Loyola University's Stritch Medical School of Medicine in Chicago. Dr. Pat Warden is well known for his follower load experimental model and is widely recognized as one of the top experts in the field of spine biomechanics. And our third speaker is Dr. Steve Kurtz, who's the founder and CEO of the biomedical consulting firm Gyroid and former director of Exponents Medical Device Practice and a research professor at Drexel, Drexel University's School of Biomedical Engineering, Science, and Health Systems in Philadelphia. We have a packed agenda ahead of us, and I'm sure by the end of the master class, you will leave with a much better understanding of this new procedure and its potential to transform the treatment of leg and back pain. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Hodges, who will begin our master class tonight. Dr. Hodges. Good evening. On behalf of Dr. Pat Warden and Dr. Kurtz, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening for this discussion of the world's first and only lumbar total joint replacement. Look, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon like many of you on the program tonight. And it didn't take me long in the early part of my career to realize that lumbar fusion patients were just not getting uh, the outcomes that I often thought they should have, despite really uh, appropriate looking x-rays. And it's those poor outcomes uh, of the lumbar fusion that ultimately has led us to where we are tonight. We started in around 2004 with Dr. Reichling with some anatomic dissection and discussion, particularly around Camden's uh, triangle. Uh, we then traveled to Cleveland to the Natural History Museum where we uh, did hundreds of uh, osteologic measurements of utilizing the Heyman Todd collection. Uh, we then did uh, scores of cadaver tests utilizing the follower load methodologies of Dr. Pat Warden. This ultimately led to two small pilot studies in South Africa in 2007 and 2008. This data was then analyzed by medical metrics, which led to a much larger, almost 100 patient pilot study in Grand Cayman in 2017. The third pilot data study was then utilized to not only gain FDA approval to start an IDE study for the joint replacement, but also gave us breakthrough designation from the FDA. We do have an amazing team that includes Dr. Craig Humphreys, who's one of the co-founders of the technology and the company. We all know that the pain generators of lumbar spine are generally the facet joints, the compressed nerves, the degenerated disc, and some malalignment. If we're going to give the patient the maximum benefit from surgery, we're gonna to have to reconstruct all three columns of the lumbar spine and that's uh, what we want to uh, discuss further. One of the underlying problems has always been access to the posterior aspect of the inner body space. And the only way we really can gain that access is to remove both facet joints completely. Um, once we remove both facet joints, then we have to have the ability to insert some kind of a device that's going to restabilize the spine 
And our goal was to not only restabilize the spine, but also provide motion. And the way that this can be accomplished is through a wedge-shaped posterior column uh, osteotomy that opens up the posterior aspect of the inner body space, allows the insertion of a motion device, and recreates stability and allows the motion desired. In order to have an implant that functions properly, you must have the tail component that you see on the right to provide uh, initial fixation and st stabilization. Like you, I've seen way too many of these patients in my own practice as well as in other surgeons' practices. These are patients that have surgery, wind up with hyperphysiologic forces either above or below the fusion, requiring revision surgery, and then after multiple revision surgeries, the patients just have a rather poor quality of life. You may not have known us before, but we are a small but mature company. We're now attending all of the major spine meetings, including AANS, ISAS, and NAS. We, over the last 18 years, have spent just north of $50 million in R&D, as well as the initial pilot studies, starting our career as the Kenai device uh, working in conjunction with Medtronic. We are a total joint replacement because we do replace the function of the facet joints and the disc. It's a very contemporary articulating surface utilizing vitamin E, a highly cross-linked polyethylene, which articulates on a cobalt chromium end plate. The powered osteotomy is an essential part of the overall surgery. We're able to create uh, entry down the axis of both pedicles, insert a restabilizing device that has a potential of 18 degrees of motion. Anytime we discuss this overall technology, there's a lot of the same questions. It comes from uh, whether it be surgeon or uh, company representative, we always get some of the same questions and we want to try to answer those for you this evening. Let's start by understanding what normal mechanics of a healthy spine would look like. It's quite clear from a lot of research that the lumbar spine, and in particular the lower lumbar spine, is predominantly a uniaxial motion with flexion and extension. The axial rotation is almost within a margin of error. So we look at this usually as a uniaxial uh, motion. It's not only the quantity of the motion that's important, but it's also the quality of the motion. Some people label the quality of the motion as a kinematic signature. How does the spine move as it goes from flexion to extension or vice versa? And it all starts by making sure that we're creating the native uh, center of rotation with the device. This ultimately does have significant impact on the adjacent levels and the subsequent need or lack of a need for revision surgeries. Here we demonstrate a low displacement curve in looking at the overall quality of motion as we go from extension to flexion. We should be able to retrace from flexion back to extension using identically the same pathway. If we're not, then we, have, uh, we may have plenty of, of motion, but it may be poor quality of motion. The center of rotation of L4 is approximately 40 yard line if we measure from the back of the vertebral body and it's near the superior end plate. At L5, uh, S1, the uh, center of rotation is a bit more posterior. It's about the 35 yard line measuring from the back of the vertebral body. And it is not just a single spot, it is a zone. And that's because we're going to need the center of rotation to uh, function uh, standing and in sitting, and certainly the center of rotation that one would have in standing is not going to be the same spot as one would have once they flex into a sitting position. Again, the human body is a linkage system. It's important that we have good function of all of the uh, linkage system from working from the ground up. So if we have stiffness in the hips, uh, and one transitions from standing to sitting, there's going to have to be compensation somewhere. Many times that is in the spine. So as you see on the left, if you have already had some degeneration of your lumbar spine and you're slightly out of balance, if your hip is really and your pelvis is stiff, when you go to sit, you're going to have to compensate through the mid and upper lumb, uh, thoracic spine. And thus you're going to get even more out of balance. So unless we are able to replicate what we see uh, in the second series uh, drawings where we're in balance standing and in sitting, then our, we were going to have difficulty in a normal functional activity. 
One of the best ways to analyze whether there's motion throughout the lumbar spine and pelvis is to look at the L1PA, which has been popularized by Mike Kelly. Uh, this measurement gives you a very quick assessment if there is stiffness occurring and where that stiffness is occurring. We know sagittal balance is the neutral line of gravity falling through the body that allows us to be most energy efficient and sagittal alignment is uh, the overall postural changes that occur in the spine pelvis in the lower extremities to allow spinal balance and sagittal alignment to be coexistent. If we look at this example, here's a normal patient that has 54 degrees of lordosis. There's normal wedging of the bone and the disc. And uh, most of that wedging of the bone and disc is going to occur in the lower two segments of the lumbar spine. In this particular model, we've left everything normal, except we've taken away the 15 degrees of wedging that was in the L5-S1 disc. But just that loss of 15 degrees decreases the lumbar lordosis to the point that we're already in, in sagittal malalignment. There's really only two ways for us to regain normal sagittal position for this spine. That is, we have to add something to the anterior column, or we have to subtract something from the posterior column. And we propose a wedge-shaped 15-degree posterior column uh, osteotomy, which then allows the spine to return back to its normal sagittal position and alignment, and the patient returning to normal function. Now, we speak a lot about the standing position, but guess what? We just don't function only in standing in life now. If you look at these statistics from the U.S. Uh, the Bureau of Labor, we see that even in 2016, we were spending much more time sitting than we are standing. We're not the farming and manufacturing society of the 1960s and 1970s. So with so many people spending so much time in the sitting position, we must also consider what happens with spinal balance as we transition from standing to sitting. If not, we're going to have a spine that's well aligned in the standing position, but then when they transition to the sitting position, they're going to have hyperphysiologic functions due to the stiffness of the spine, and that's going to lead to sitting intolerance and chronic pain, and ultimately, many of those will require revision surgery. In order to have a normal functioning spine, you have to have active muscle function uh, of the trunk. If not, then it only takes less than a tenth of the normal in vivo compressive load to cause buckling of the spine. In fact, in the lumbar spine, less than 25 pounds uh, and your spine will buckle if you don't have active muscle forces. It is important we keep in mind that the two forces that work on the lumbar spine are predominantly compression and shear. And it is these shear forces that probably get the attention of surgeons the most. If we didn't have normal active muscle function, if you had a high sacral tilt such as 60 degrees, you're going to have actually more shear than you do compression. But that's really not what happens, um, as we will see in just a minute. If we utilize the um, uh, calculation of forces uh, to uh, simulate a non-functioning muscle envelope around the trunk, we're going to grossly overestimate uh, the amount of shear force that's acting on that segment. Uh, there's a great study that was carried out by uh, Dr. Hahn and colleagues at the University of Iowa and published in the European Spine Journal in 1995. And they were looking at in vivo shear loading. And what they were able to show is that no matter what loading mode or how much weight that was applied, you always had more compression than shear. And that's because the muscle forces were converting shear forces uh, to compression forces. And with closer analysis, Dr. Pat Warden was able to show that this is fairly constant, no matter what load or what mode of loading. And that is, there's about a four or five times greater compression force as compared to a shear force, as long as you have normal active muscle forces around uh, the lumbar spine and pelvis. So in fact, the body doesn't uh, operate as you see on this diagram on the left, but operates much more like the uh, diagram on the right, where there's uh, four or five times more compression load compared to shear forces. It is also now possible that we can use in vitro uh, methods to test an implant and get in vivo-like information. And that's all through the creation of the follow-load methodologies, Dr. Pat Warden, which he'll discuss uh, further. 
But suffice it to say that we now have to consider standing and sitting when it comes uh, to evaluation of motion and stability of the lumbar spine. And sitting is actually so important that we have some authors now saying sitting is the new smoking. And leading into uh, my topic. So I think I will begin with uh, it's a background to before I go into the motion preservation, I'll begin with uh, the issues with lumbar fusion. So the biggest issue with uh, lumbar fusion is the is what happens over the years with the uh, adjacent segment. Uh, adjacent segment pathology refers to adjacent segment degeneration uh, and pain at that adjacent level to the extent that you might need uh, some treatment, especially surgical uh, reconstruction. The symptomatic uh, adjacent segment pathology requiring further surgery uh, occurs about two to three percent in of patients uh, who get lumbar fusions per year. And over 10 years, the prevalence, uh, if it's a cross-sectional uh, def definition, the prevalence uh, 10 years postoperative is about 20 to 25 percent of the patients who had lumbar fusion will develop uh, this symptomatic adjacent level uh, pathology that will require um, uh, further surgery. And this has been well established. A lot of publications talking about um, <laughs> the statistics and so forth. And also shown that incidence uh, of adjacent segment disease increases with the number of fusion levels. When you go from one level fusion to two level to three level, uh, the incidence uh, substantially increases. Previous studies uh, have suggested that hypolordotic fusion alignment uh, is a risk factor for adjacent segment pathology. And uh, also you might have heard of, uh, or I'm sure the surgeons know about all this. this hypolordotic fusion creates flat back deformity and so forth. But here we are concerned about just the adjacent segment. Uh, and many clinical studies as well as biomechanical studies have shown that hypolordotic fusion uh, leads to increased risk of uh, adjacent segment issues. Uh, now, as uh, Dr. Hodges uh, talked about uh, how the current society, you know, we sit more than we stand in a lot of, uh, you know, lot, in a lot of uh, occupations, uh, people sit eight to 10 hours a day, uh, any office workers and so forth. And so I wanted to know, we wanted to know uh, is post fusion sitting, you know, if in a patient having had a couple levels of fusion and if he or she sat uh, for occupational reasons or just to relax, is that gonna be a risk factor for adjacent segment pathology? So we thought that supraphysiologic, that means more than normal physiologic stresses at the, at the junctional segment between the fused segment and the mobile segments uh, will create uh, degenerative changes, which can lead to junctional break breakdown uh, over time. So we went to this clinic in Bordeaux and they, uh, we looked at uh, about uh, 15 or to 20 volunteers subjects, they're mostly residents and uh, nursing staff in their hospital. Um, so we took, we uh, standardized their standing posture, sitting posture and slump posture and, and looked at their spinal alignment. These colors, red, yellow, and pink, they are just super uh, imposed so that we can see the spine alignment better. So physically, I mean, picture, pic, this graphically, when you look at this alignment on the left standing versus sitting versus uh, slump sitting, you can sort of see how drastic the alignment changes are taking place. And you can measure the changes quantitatively by seeing what happens with the sacral slope, which is shown here. Uh, sacral slope is in, in on, on average of that group that we looked at, sacral slope is about 37 degrees while standing, while erect, erect sitting, it is about 25 or 26 degrees. So basically uh, what that showed is that your sacral slope changes. <clears throat> um, and so if, if the, assuming that the, the upper spine did not 
make any comp compensatory moves when you fuse the the lower two levels and the sacral tilt reduced from 37 to 25 you see that the whole upper spine will go backwards and if when you are slumping the the sacral slope is reduced even more so and if there is no compensation from the uh, proximal spine segments then uh, the the disparity with, will be you know uh, tremendous and so what it is showing is that in a normal standing to sitting posture, when nothing was fused, the upper lumbar spine from L1 to L4, because L4 to sacrum is fused. And so before fusion, L1 to L4 segments have to contribute only about two degrees of flexion going from standing to regular sitting. And to go from there to slump sitting, uh, the L1 to L4 uh, segments have to go go to 13 uh, degrees. So quite a bit increase from the comp compensation of the immediate uh, proximal segment. And going from standing to slump, it's, uh, the comp compensation becomes even worse. Uh, normally, uh, it would be 20 degrees from standing to slump. So the L1 to L4 levels will have to compensate 20 degrees, uh, but after fusion, they had to com compensate about 30, double, almost double that. So, and most of the compensation occurs by design, it occurs in the first one or two segments right after, above, the, above the fusion. And that, that is what theoretically you can predict what is gonna happen, that that is gonna subject these adjacent segments um, to, su to supraphysiologic forces and may lead to uh, degeneration changes. So this was the hypothesis based upon uh, uh, alignment changes observations in, in real people. That led us to this conclusion that the increased compensatory demand on junctional segments can uh, explain patients sitting in dollars that Dr. Hodges talked about and, and pain after lumbar effusion. And it also increases the risk of Junctional breakdown. So we wanted to uh, actually reproduce that uh, in the laboratory, and then therefore compare if we, if we can create a laboratory model of this, going from standing to sitting, then we can compare what happens to adjacent levels when you have fusion from L4 to sacrum versus motion preservation from L4 mm -hmm. to sacrum. So this is a. Um, schematic view of our apparatus on the left panel. So this is actually a, a human thoracolumbar spine specimen taken from a donor spine, going from about T10, 10th thoracic vertebra all the way to down to sacrum. And what you see here is just basically optoelectronic sensors that we, we use to non-invasively uh, 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 measure in real time measure three-dimensional motions and so forth. And then this white cable you see is the follow load cable that Dr. Hodges uh, talked about that reproduces uh, physiologic uh, compressive preload uh, during activities of daily living. And then we simulated two main um, activities that all of us perform or most of us perform. One major activity that is from standing and forward flexion and backward flexion, so for flexion and extension. And then on the right, this is the first time anyone has simulated a transition from standing to sitting under this physiologic uh, preload. And that is, that is achieved by holding this vertebra uh, relatively constant uh, and, and rotating, the, rotating the sacrum because that allows the sacral, sacral slope to be varied in a controlled manner. And we can then observe what's going on in terms of how, do the, how does the alignment of the lumbar spine changes. So we had this model validated, validated against the radiographic data. And the beauty of the model is that we can then measure forces and moments and intradiscal pressures and so forth. So here is just a sample uh, results. 
so we are looking at what is happening at the l3 4 motion segment which is just proximal to the l4 to s1 fusion so when everything is uh, intact uh, so before any fusion was performed the l3 4 motion segment going from standing to sitting had to flex about two degrees. But after L4 to sacrum fusion, the same uh, process of that going from standing to sitting, uh, that L3-4 segment has to move more than four degrees. So about two times the value that is needed uh, when everything is intact. And this is not, so this is the laboratory result. And here is a real example, clinical example, again, uh, observed in Bordeaux on, in our second trip. So this patient has uh, L4 to sacrum solid fusion, it was done before we got there. So while uh, up in upright standing, these are the lordotic wedge angles between say, between L3 and L4, L2 and L3, so let's focus on uh, L3 and L4. So the wedge angle at L3, L4, this space uh, during standing after the fusion is over 12 degrees in lordosis. And then if I, when I ask this person to sit slump, in a slump sitting uh, manner, you can see that now uh, this has a zero degree wedge angle. So that means in order to com sit comfortably in a slump sitting mode, this patient, this adjacent the proximal uh, lumbar segment has to give, has to produce 12 degrees of compensation. And, and in fact, in another panel, which I'm not showing here, that's the maximum capacity of flexion at that L3-4 segment. So what I'm showing here is going from standing to sitting the, the segment above, immediately above the, uh, uh, the above the fusion, has to compensate uh, in order to uh, in order to assume a comfortable sitting posture, and it has to compensate in flexion as much as uh, in, in if if I ask him this person to flex forward in a most I mean forceful manner, this is the limit of that segment. So. 12 degrees is the maximum flexion this, this can produce. And that is what this disc is producing while uh, the patient is uh, sitting. So you can imagine over time how uncomfortable that would be with the increased stresses and so forth. And eventually uh, might even break down, that level might break down over time. So, and then if, if you, when in our experiment, when we did, uh, a two level joint replacement from L4 to sacrum. Now the intact segment, I mean, sorry, the, the proximal segment L3, L4 has to only produce 1.6 degrees going from standing to sitting, pretty much like the even less than what the intact uh, segment, intact spine had to do. So basically having a two level uh, joint replacement we normalize the kinematics of this lumbar spine to back to where there was, as if there was no, no fusion. Uh, and if it was fusion, we would have to, uh, this level, L3-4 level has to double up on its compensation. Uh, so if you, if you say intact level, uh, if you say the L3-4 level in the intact specimen has to do one unit of work uh, after fusion of L4 to sacrum, it has to uh, do two, two and a half times the uh, the work. And having a two level uh, joint replacement, you are basically normalizing uh, that uh, kinematics and eliminating that deleterious effect of two level fusion. In fact, what this table doesn't show is we also looked at uh, a hybrid construct where L5 S1 is fused and L4 else, uh, L4 L5 has a joint replacement, uh, and you are al almost as good as intact. Not quite like this, but much much better than a two-level fuse. So there, there is an advantage to even to do doing a hybrid uh, 
construct uh, and and basically what is what i'm trying to show is uh, l4 s1 uh, levels contribute the most in terms of uh, what is required to go from standing to sitting postures and if you fuse those you are eliminating most of the mobility and making the remaining levels pick up the the you know, uh, com compensate for that loss of mobility and even a uh, so a two level motion preservation or even hybrid construct will restore and uh, restore normal kinematics and and eliminate uh, the bad effects of fusion so the conclusion of this uh, uh, experiment and and in vivo work we did is that sitting requires lower lumbar segments to undergo flexion which is and then the fusion of the lower lumbar, lumbar segments requires even more uh, more work from the from the remaining segments thereby increasing loading on the lumbar spine and the increased loading after lumbar fusion during sitting uh, may cause patients uh, discomfort and you know and this Eight hours a day sitting can even lead to junk, over time junctional breakdown. So motion preservation uh, at the lower lumbar level, particularly, can help improve patient comfort and, and function during activities of daily living. Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Kurtz, and uh, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about some of the durability testing we did of the Modus design um, while I was still at Exponent. Uh, my colleague, Ryan Siski, is uh, responsible for a lot of the wear testing we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, I have since moved on from Exponent, but throughout the entire time period, I've also been affiliated with Drexel, where we've done a lot of the pivotal wear studies of retrieved total disc replacements. And I'll talk about that tonight as well. So when we were looking at benchmarking the MODIS design, uh, we had a lot of options for how we were going to do that. But the decision that we made was to use international standards that would allow us to effectively benchmark against the previous generation of anterior lumbar discs. I'm going to discuss some of the engineering analysis that was done to minimize wear and damage, talk about the choices that were made and the type of polyethylene and uh, what the implications are for a durable lumbar total joint replacement design. Uh, I started uh, my my uh, career in spine uh, after many decades looking at large hips and knees and polyethylene in those implants uh, with uh, polyethylene on cobalt chrome anterior total disc replacements, the first uh, design, the Charité. Um, and in the first retrievals that we had access to, uh, we saw uh, kind of the same kinds of damage that we saw in total hips and knees, both the adhesive abrasive wear, as well as oxidation damage, fracture, and impingement. And we wanted to really understand the, the biomechanics of this. And so that led us to collaborate with uh, Dr. Pat Warden and try to compare our retrievals, what we saw with our retrievals, with what he was seeing with the same uh, type of design in his follower load model. And kind of the two um, kind of uh, main findings that we saw from the retrievals were that some discs seem to be fine and rotate with minimal impingement, and others seem to be kind of locked in place. Whereas in uh, this kind of uh, lined up well with Dr. Pat's experiments, where he likewise saw that in some cases you were able to see um, motion that was unconstrained, and in other cases, motion where the disc became locked in place. And that kind of jived really well with what we were seeing with this particular design uh, of uh, total disc replacement. Uh, we then kind of took it another step level. My PhD student at Drexel, Steve Rundell, developed a finite element model where we could look at lots of different design configurations, look at the role of facets and how those applied shear loads to the anterior disc when you had different kinds of sizing changes. And we were able to reproduce in our recreations of retrievals with our biomechanical models, the same kind of rim bending and impingement studies that we saw and scenarios that we saw uh, in our uh, retrievals. Now, uh, 
fast forward 15 years later, and we have developed uh, international standards for wear and impingement. Uh, these standards were based largely on some of the retrieval on the retrieval work uh, that I just described. Uh, first, you have standards that describe the durability under wear, wear conditions. And then uh, there is a separate standard for assessing the durability of the designs uh, under impingement scenarios. And one of the characteristics of that, of that standard, which uh, we developed uh, collaboratively with uh, folks from the FDA, was to make sure that uh, you designed your impingement scenario to be reflective of the type of design that you were going to have and the biomechanical situation that you were going to, it was going to see. And so we, we took that kind of make sure that you do the biomechanical design um, uh, to the next level in assessing uh, the modus. First with, uh, before it ever went on a simulator, we simulated the simulator and looked at different design conditions to minimize the contact stresses at the bearing surface. And uh, on top of that, we also designed the um, uh, bearing material uh, or the off the non-traditional bearing material that could potentially come into impingement to make sure that if it did come into impingement, that it was seeing uh, conforming uh, impingement friendly uh, geometry. Now, having a next generation design now leads you to decide, ask the question, what type of polyethylene uh, should you use? And uh, polyethylene is, is uh, a great, I'm not, I've studied polyethylene for many years. So it's, I consider it a great material for an artificial joint. It's used extensively in hips and knees, and it has been since the 1960s. Uh, but the first generation of polyethylene that was used, which we call historical today, saw lots of different kinds of damage, wear, uh, and osteolysis. So on one hand, it was a great material because the entire field of joint replacement would not exist without this material, definitely room for improvement. But we saw this same type of material in the first generation of polyethylenes, which were again, gamma sterilized in air that allowed it to oxidatively degrade. And I think we all refer to this as old poly. Nobody uses this polyethylene anymore. In the early 19, in the mid 1990s, people figured out that you could package the material to protect it from oxidation while it was on the shelf. Uh, we call that today conventional polyethylene. And that does great. The polyethylene won't oxidize on the shelf anymore but it still can oxidize in vivo. But nevertheless, this was a major improvement over the historical polyethylene. It's still used today, and it is what is used today in all of the lumbar disc replacements that use polyethylene, uh, to my knowledge today, that are uh, approved for, for use in the United States. This conventional polyethylene, or as I like to say, 1990s polyethylene. Uh, in the late 1990s, uh, researchers found a way to improve the polyethylene by using radiation cross-linking. And there were different ways that people developed to stabilize the polyethylene against oxidation. The first way was using heat treatments. And in the second generation, they tried to get away from heat treatments because those uh, had compromises with material properties leading to second generation of material. One of these types of generation materials is to prevent oxidation in the highly cross-linked polyethylene with a natural antioxidant uh, such as vitamin E. And vitamin E is, is now widely used in uh, total joint replacements uh, across the world. Um, there are uh, many examples in the hips and knees for its use. Uh, I had grabbed this chart here from the American Joint Replacement. Blue is vitamin E stabilization, and you can see that it's grown in total knees uh, to be uh, almost equal to highly crossing polyethylene, and the trend for conventional polyethylene continues to be down. And there are many review articles that describe the long-term successful clinical performance of vitamin E uh, highly crossing polyethylene. So having chosen this advanced material with advanced design, we wanted to put it through um, a state-of-the-art uh, benchmarking wear and impingement tests. These included a standard wear test, 
an abrasive wear test, an impingement test, all done according to international standards. Um, these standards all require the use of uh, multiple, because we had so many tests to do, um, multiple uh, dedicated MTS spine wear simulators were used. Uh, in these tests, the test simulates many cycles, millions of cycles of loading, flexion, extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. And at intervals, at preset intervals, the test is interrupted and the components are taken out, they're weighed, they're photographed, they're micro CT'd. And we also looked at uh, stuff like wear particles in addition to the mass loss. This just gives you an idea of the configuration of uh, MODIS in a, a wear simulator a a test rig. You've got a left and right bearing. Uh, there is the polyethylene superior components and the metallic inferior components. And they're loaded uh, in a fixture uh, and surrounded by a simulator fluid and cyclically loaded as I described. When we did the, the wear simulation under standard conditions, we found that uh, a low wear rate of, of approximately 1.2 uh, milligrams per million cycles. And uh, using micro CT, we found uh, minimal penetration of uh, less than 0.3 uh, millimeters. So this bearing here, again, these are pictures of the components after 10 million cycles um, that show kind of the characteristic adhesive abrasive wear, kind of the wear polishing that you normally see in a total hip replacement bearing. Uh, then we challenged the, uh, in a separate series of tests, uh, in an abrasive test, uh, by scratching the cobalt chrome components, assembling them in the simulator, and exercising them uh, for 5 million cycles. And uh, we didn't see a, a major increase in the wear rate. Um, the polyethylene component became uh, more scuffed, uh, but the wear rate was again 1.1 million cycle milligrams per million cycles. And the penetration was slightly larger at 0.34 millimeters at the end of 5 million cycles. The impingement test is a little bit more involved because it requires analyzing the components and setting them up in a configuration so that they see the worst case impingement scenarios. Uh, and unlike in the wear test where you could use test coupons that only include the bearing surface, for the impingement test, you have to include the entire articulating and non-articulating uh, sides of the bearing that are going to impinge. And uh, we tested uh, both the short and the long sizes. We weren't really sure whether the long or the short was going to be the worst case. So we uh, analyzed both bearing configurations. And you can see the, um, the contact area occurring at the shoulder or the rim of the polyethylene component impinging uh, pretty much exactly where we simulated it was going to impinge. And uh, here, the biggest impingement occurs at the rim and is uh, 0.29 millimeters for the short size. And then for the longer size, it's slightly less impingement because it has a slightly larger contact area. The, the rim is larger. It spreads out the, the contact stresses uh, and leads to a less impingement in that scenario. So, um, as a result of our testing uh, with international standards, all the engineering analysis and the vitamin E bearing material, uh, we benchmarked our study. Our rates fall well within the range of uh, wear rates uh, that are described in the scientific literature for a single anterior disc with the two uh, bilateral uh, components of the total joint replacement. And here are some of the studies that we're referencing as uh, the basis for the published range of uh, anterior discs. And is again, the whole reason to use a benchmark standard um, because you can then compare your results to what other people have found in the literature. Now, when you have a durable bearing that enables the constrained motion that uh, is a feature of the modus design. Um, the goal of uh, the modus design is to reproduce 
the biomechanics of the functional spine uh, that has been described by Dr. Hodges and Dr. Pat Warden, not to precisely anatomically replicate it. So I think of that as uh, a functional design rather than uh, a anatomic design. And we've seen very, very similar analogies to that in the design of total joint replacements, kind of one camp, one philosophy is anatomic, one philosophy is functional. This is really a functional philosophy uh, to reproduce the function of a uh, motion segment of the lumbar spine. And the feasibility of this uh, philosophy is demonstrated by the earlier generations of uh, this design with metal on metal bearings. And so you see a very similar uh, philosophy played out in many other designs like total knee replacements. John Insall's philosophy was don't do an anatomic knee and preserve the cruciate limit, ligaments, take them out and use the spine to constrain the motion. The design provides the functional equivalent of and constraint of the ligaments. And that was a big deal. There were lots of debates for decades about which philosophy, anatomic or uh, functional, is the right one for a total knee replacement. I'm sure we're going to have those same kind of debates in uh, total joint replacement of the spine as well. Now let's look at the in vitro testing of the MODIS device, which should give us some in vivo-like data. We were able to find a uh, grade one isthmic spondylolisthesis specimen. We tested that with and without the active muscle function using the follower load and found that there was really no instability until we removed more than 25% of the nucleus palliposus. When we insert the uh, MODIS device, we find that there is complete stability uh, both with and without active muscle function as we depict here. This is with active muscle function, this is without active muscle function, and there's no translational or rotational instability. So we're quite comfortable in telling you that with our laboratory data as well as our pilot data, we feel the MODIS uh, lumbar joint replacement is able to provide stability even under extreme conditions of compression and shear loading. Now let's look at surgical principles and techniques. Some of our principles in, and the main principle is that we're gonna return each segment of the lumbar spine back to its normal sagittal position. In order to do that, we really have to know what normal is. So we've taken the data from Bernhard and Bridwell that was published in Spine, as well as uh, Jackson and Manis also published in Spine. These were young, healthy uh, uh, patients that had no symptoms and, and we were able to uh, use the averages. We find that the wedging of the bone, the wedging of the disc at L5S1 gives us a 25 degree total lordosis. And you can see the different numbers for the different levels for what normal should be. We're able to do this restoration of alignment by utilizing this posterior wedge shaped osteotomy which not only opens up the back of the uh, inner body space, uh, but allows us to correct alignment. The implant will be placed so that there is loading across the apophyseal ring and as well across the uh, pedicle. Even though we do the osteotomy, the pedicle bone that remains is predominantly cortical. And, and we have seen no clinical cases of subsidence at the osteotomy site. So with the osteotomy, we are able to uh, treat the pain generators and return each segment back to its normal sagittal position and have stability through the implantation. So let's look at the actual technique itself. Here's the implant. It's a very simple but elegant design. The contemporary uh, shavers that are attached to our own power source. There's an alignment guide that helps us create collinear keel cuts, uh, both in the in place. Here's the power source itself. Uh, again, our instrumentation is only a single tray that has an alignment guide, uh, distractors, both length and height trials, and is very simple, but very uh, um, efficient. As we look at the implant itself, we see that there's a plasma titanium plasma spray uh, which allows a bony end growth in a total of 18 degrees of motion. There is a retention clip, which is cobalt chromium, and, and uh, the screw is self-tapping. Uh, the retention clip uh, 
gives a nice stability to the screw. And this is inserted all the way to the uh, instantaneous center rotation that we've previously mentioned, which is also the neutral axis of rotation. We see by using convergence and the keels that we are locking out translational as well as rotational uh, instability. This gives us the ability to treat almost all normal spine degenerative conditions such as stenosis, recurrent herniation, et cetera. Patients placed prone on a spine frame, a posterior decompression, including complete bilateral facetectomy is carried out. And then the reciprocating uh, shavers uh, are used to then carry out an osteotomy. The osteotomy then opens up the back of the inner body space. We're now able to just barely roughen the end plate of the superior end plate uh, to create a punctate bleeding surface for bony end growth. Many times we don't even have to use the shaver on the uh, upper end plate. We then do our final trialing for height and for our length. Uh, the length trial is based upon the instantaneous center of rotation. And finally, we use the keel cutter. We start with the inferior end plate keel cutting. The alignment guide then allows a collinear keel cut in the superior end plate. The implant is loaded in neutral and inserted with just general impaction. And finally, the uh, set screw is inserted, self-tapping, locked in place, and the Inserter is removed. We do all the work on one side, then move to the contralateral side and complete uh, implantation on uh, likewise. So soft tissue balancing is an important part of this procedure, just like you would have in a total knee. We start by taking off the facets, removing the disc, leaving the lateral annulus and the anterior annulus, anterior uh, longitudinal ligma complex. We then serially dilate, starting with the uh, thinnest uh, distractor necessary and serially dilate side to side until we reach uh, normal height uh, for that segment. Uh, many times it's gonna be uh, 10, 11, or 12 uh, millimeters in height. Typically, uh, we get to a minimum of 11 millimeters and, and if necessary, we can go all the way up to 15 millimeters, but we want to, once we have soft tissue balancing, uh, we then carry out the osteotomy followed by the keel cuts and the implantation. As we already mentioned, there's height trialing, keel cutting, and the osteotomy is uh, the vehicle whereby we're able to carry out all of these techniques. There is convergence uh, as we go from caudal to, to cephalad in the lumbar spine along the axis of the pedicle. And we don't need a lot of convergence in the upper lumbar spine so because we have predominantly only compressive forces there. So the implant can be used at all segments of the lumbar spine. Uh, here is a, a image of a, that I've used on the uh, PAC system. Uh, I've analyzed uh, the L5-S1 level. There's 10 degrees of wedging of the bone of L5. Uh, since we know normal is 25 degrees, that means we need a 15 degree osteotomy to replace all the wedging of the disc. And you can see that I've outlined that. In every case, we look at both the standing and sitting spinal pelvic parameters, including L1PA. Here we have our instrumentation tray. It's only a single tray that's quite elegant. Here's the power source that we previously mentioned. Look, it takes eight trays to do a lumbar T-lift procedure. There's a lot of cost involved. Each one of these have been uh, wrapped and sterilized. And you can see that we're only a single pan. There's, a, this is very important to the hospital, to the uh, orthopedic manufacturers, and to uh, almost all of the stakeholders involved in this uh, treatment paradigm. Here's the hospital uh, where I uh, practice. This is just uh, the normal storage area. You can see just how uh, expensive it is to keep all of these uh, implants and trays and instrumentation trays uh, on, the, on the table. I've had the great pleasure of training uh, all 20 uh, surgeons that are now involved in our IDE. This was carried out at the Mary Lab in Memphis. Uh, it's very teachable. Um, it's uh, something that all the surgeons get quite excited about.
Uh, many of them come in very skeptical, but before they leave, they're uh, total believers that a joint replacement of the lumbar spine is possible. We're currently in the middle of an IEDE trial. Uh, we'll collect this data and have more information about that later. Um, we certainly want to take care of all stakeholders, including the surgeons. We're happy to report that we already have our own T code that's published in the AMA guides that is specifically for a, a posterior lumbar total joint uh, replacement. Uh, we will have another uh, master class, which will really focus on our pilot outcome data, and we'll go in great detail. And this was all generated to our medical travel plan, which I'm sure you've heard about. And this has really uh, been a unique program that has uh, proven to us that the patients are now going to be driving uh, the choices for what their treatment. They're on the internet, they're at reading, they know what they want and they don't want. We see a, uh, very strongly a large group of patients sitting on the sidelines that are not seeking treatment because they continue to have pain, but they don't want a lumbar fusion. And these patients are gonna come off the sidelines and be treated when they feel that they've got a, their, a better option that's gonna get their problem resolved completely and for the long term. I think you have to keep in mind that an uh, older surgeon like myself actually did see knee fusions for something other than tumor. Likewise, I even saw a few hip fusions for degenerative conditions. And today that's something we wouldn't even think about. All degenerative conditions of the hip are gonna be treated with a hip arthroplasty. So here we are in 2023 doing lumbar total joint replacements. It's a very reproducible surgery. Surgeons can learn it. It's very safe. And uh, these are examples of cases that we have completed and it can be done at all levels of the lumbar spine. And I'd like to show you one final uh, case and it demonstrates what we really want to achieve in the long run. And that is, here's a patient on the left that's standing that has a uh, replacement of L5S1 with a joint replacement as they transition to sitting. We have motion through the upper lumbar spine. We have motion through the index level of surgery in the device. And we have the pelvis rotating posteriorly and uh, just as it should in a normal, healthy 30-year-old patient. And tonight, we really thank you for the time you've given us. Thank you very much to our master faculty. Those are really outstanding talks. Now, would each member of our faculty please turn on your camera and your microphone, and we'll start our Q&A portion. Okay, I, I've noticed during the meeting tonight, we had a lot of people putting in questions. Okay, actually, I, I'm gonna pause just for another minute or another few seconds. All right, I think we're ready. All right, our first question actually is for Dr. Hodges. Uh, let's see, five, five, one versus four, five, and the other levels. What's the difference in this procedure at five, one? Well, good question. And there really is a lot of difference biomechanically, as Dr. Pat and Steve have pointed out at L5S1. Obviously, the sacral slope is usually much steeper than the uh, lordotic angulation that we have at L4-5. Um, and thus, it is one of the more challenging levels, particularly when you're trying to do an anterior procedure, particularly a motion device anteriorly. So posteriorly, we are able, through the osteotomy that we've discussed, to actually lower and change the pelvic incidence. And we can open up the back of the spine, as we mentioned previously, and the access to that posterior inner body space is uh, quite simple and straightforward. And we can create a significant change in the overall sagittal position of that particular segment. Right, no, that's that's terrific. Okay, we I think I'm gonna send this next question to you, Dr. Petwarden. You have tested just about every spinal implant on the market today. This concept seems pretty simple. What does actual quality of motion look like in these tests compared to say the anterior disc replacement type systems or even a native disc? Good question, uh, Robin. Uh, if you remember, uh, we, uh, 
L5, S1 or L4, L5, or any lumbar segment actually is a considered a um, three joint complex. It's like a three legged stool. We have the disc in the front and the two facet joints in the back. So in a three legged stool uh, analogy, if one leg goes bad, obviously the other two cannot, will not be able to sit on that stool. So that's basically what happens uh, if the disc space, which is most likely the first to degenerate, uh, over time, the posterior joints also will degenerate. And by addressing only the, the front leg, or the anterior column, you are not really uh, using an anterior approach. You're not able to address what's going on in the back. And therefore, there is a limit to how good your um, resulting motion is going to be, whether it's really pain, you know, pain free or uh, it has to, whatever you put in the front has to work with what's in the back. And so that's a difficult uh, scenario. In this case, which is in my experience, the first uh, total joint replacement, all three joints are being uh, addressed. So you have a much better uh, ability to match the center of rotation, at, especially at the lower levels, at the L5, S1 level, which tends to be much posterior than at L4, 5, and certainly at L3, 4, and up. And so with this, we are able to address the, um, the all three pathologies, anterior, middle, uh, anterior column, as well as two facet joints but also match the kinematic uh, signature of L5, S1. And that's what we have observed uh, in our testing. Wow, very interesting. Um, that's great, thank you. That The next question I'm gonna send over to you, Dr. Kurtz. Uh, you know, we often talk about six degrees of freedom, but this technology looks like one degree of freedom. Uh, am I thinking about this right? Um, uh, I thank you for your question. I think it's, uh, I don't think you really want six degrees of freedom in your lumbar spine. Um, and as Dr. Pat just mentioned, um, and your lumbar spine uh, is constrained by the facets. And this design um, has the ability to address that constraint through this double bearing uh, design. Now, just because it has double bearings doesn't mean that it only allows motion in the, you know, anterior uh, flexion extension plane. Uh, they do have some non-conformity, so you can accommodate some lateral bending and some uh, axial torsion as well. But the bearings do provide the similar type of constraints that you would get functionally with kind of the facets. So it's not really... It's not really six degrees of freedom. You don't really want a six degree of freedom bearing, I don't think, in the lumbar spine. Can I, can I add something? Excellent. Yes, please do. Yes. Uh, you know, most of our day-to-day uh, uh, -day motions are, um, especially in the lumbar spine, are you know standing and sitting, and those happen to be uh, happen to involve uh, the sagittal plane type motion, flexion extension. Yeah. And so uh, that is why we have focused on on that particular aspect of uh, of the design. Hmm. Interesting. Very good. Uh, Dr. Hodges, did you have a, any comment you wanted to add to this? Or because that was an interesting question, I have to say. Yeah. Well, as you can imagine, Robin, we have spent literally uh, dozens, if not uh, hundreds, of hours discussing this one simple topic. And I agree with what Dr. Kurtz and Dr. Pat Warden have put forward. There's no question that in order to have a functional unit uh, of the lower lumbar spine, the uh, flexion extension movements, as we've shown in our previous discussion, are really the important movements that we need to have. So actually, let me stay with you, Dr. Hodges. Uh, we have another question here. Can you treat a completely collapsed disc using this device, or do you recommend that people wait until they are totally collapsed, in other words, at the end stage, uh, to come in for treatment? Interesting. Well, of course, we always have to treat patients. We can't treat just images. So and if you have a patient who is symptomatic and has failed conservative care and they have a completely collapsed disc, the answer is yes. We can take a completely collapsed disc, 
And uh, once we gently dilate the inner body space back to its normal height, which can be done, uh, then the osteotomy and the replacement of the prosthesis restabilizes the segment and allows the patient to continue functioning. Again, if you have a patient who is symptomatic and has failed conservative care and would meet surgical criteria and they only have a 50% collapse of the disc space, yes, I would suggest that we treat that sooner rather than later. And I think it's important to note that we feel strongly that there are many patients that are sitting on the sidelines who avoid having treatment when they're 50% collapsed because they just don't want a fusion procedure. And so they do go on over time to collapse further and further, okay? So there will be a large population of people, we believe, who will come off the benches and will actually expand the size of the market uh, due to the fact that they'll be able to get a more reliable uh, treatment in an earlier phase. I can certainly see that. Uh, one more follow-up question. You know, I had noticed in your presentation, you mentioned the Kenai program at the beginning of the talk. Uh, are, you, are you part of Medtronic? Are you affiliated in some way? No, we're not. We're not affiliated in any way. Uh, much like Sentinel did with the ProDisc when purchased from J&J, &J, that's exactly the same uh, and, and they acquired the rights to ProDisc, and, and they're completely independent of J&J. &J. In fact, J&J &J was just selling it off. Exactly. Yep. Same kind of thing. Same identical. Wonderful. Well, uh, I just have to say, uh, you know, personally, I, I get excited about technologies like this. This really, I just love this. And you are so creative and you've done a great job at bringing, other, bringing this along as well as you have. And I think tonight's program has been a wonderful way to really educate uh, a, a group of surgeons and others about this. Uh, I have to thank each of you sincerely for a really great course. And most especially, of course, we can't do this without an audience, right? So I want to thank our audience. And finally, the guy who wrote the check, thank you, Three Spine, for sponsoring this. It was, a, it was I think, well worth your sponsorship. Terrific program. I learned a lot. And I'll close with this. A recording of this really excellent masterclass will be available at ryortho.com. So please watch for that. Three Spine will also send out an email responding to every question we received tonight because we did not have time for all of them. And with that, uh, thank you all. Have a good night. And this ends the masterclass on total joint replacement for the lumbar spine. <laughs>